The shroud that was cast all over the people has been destroyed. Our separation from our God is gone forever, and death has been swallowed up forevermore. The Lord of hosts will wipe away every tear from our faces, and our disgrace is taken away. Our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. We are forgiven, for the Lord has spoken, and Jesus has conquered the grave. It will be said on that day, this is our God. We have waited for him. He has saved us. This is our God. His steadfast love endures forever. He has saved us. This is our God. We have accepted his sacrifice, and he has saved us. This is our God. We wait no more. He has made a way. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The kingdom of God is here. Let us be glad and rejoice. This is our God, and this is his salvation. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, Mariners Bethel family. My name is Leo Quark. I'm the associate pastor here at Mariners Bethel Global Methodist Church. Jesus Christ is risen today. Yes! For us as Christians, today is the most joyful day of the year. Jesus conquered the death for us. He gave us a victory over sickness, disease, pain, and sin, and he gave us eternal life. So how about we all stand and greet one another, person next to you, person behind you, or two rows behind you, just say, Happy Resurrection Day. Those are watching online, Happy Resurrection Day to you. Resurrection Day. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> Happy Resurrection Day. Do we have any visitors today? Could you boldly raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Wow. 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 Thank you. <laughs> wow, there's over there too. Wow, thank you so much. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, we want to connect with you. So after service, uh, please stop by at the welcome desk, and we have a special gift for you. And those who are watching online, if you're new, please scan the QR code on the screen and tell us about you. We want to connect with you. We are a praying church, and we are really, really serious about this. 
So if you have a prayer request today, please fill out the prayer request card in the back of your pew and drop it in the offering plate. And those who are watching online, if you have a prayer request, please scan the QR code on the screen and submit your prayer request. We have a prayer warriors uh, praying for you this week. And if you want someone to pray with you this morning, we have a prayer room open and we have a prayer warriors ready to pray with you. And also at the end of the service, we have an altar rail open for you as well. You are welcome to come and pray and someone will pray with you. And there are three ways to give your tithes and offering and more information you can find in the giving information section in your bulletin. And the church offices will be closed tomorrow. And also, there are so many activities and events are happening in the month of April. So please make sure you check your bulletin. And this time I'd like to ask Ms. Janet Freeman to pray for our worship service. Let us go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, you are our healer and our peace. You are our awesome Father. You are all powerful and you are able to do immeasurably more than we ask. Mm. You make the lame walk, you make the blind see, and you make the dead live again. We give you all glory and praise, O oh God, our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Father, we know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us our sins. Purify us from all unrighteousness. We know whenever, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses them and forsakes them will obtain mercy. We come to you now, Father, and confess our individual sins and the sins of the church body. We are sorry in closing, in choosing to do what we have sinned against you. But we know our sins are forgiven and washed away by the blood of Jesus. We claim our forgiveness and vow to, do no, to sin no more. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. You are the same today as you were yesterday and will be tomorrow. Your mercies are new every day. Thank you for this church, the body of Christ. Thank you for our place in this family, and thank you for your presence in each of us. Thank you for the beauty of the earth and the miracles of nature every day. Thank you for Pastor Becky and for the sermon series you laid on her heart, and thank you for Pastor Leo and the Lenten study he gave us. Thank you for these two leaders we have in our church, and thank you for the healing prayer service where we experience the divine exchange. Thank you for your son who died for us and who is now risen and lives amongst, among us. Thank you for your grace and mercy. And thank you for hearing our prayers and our supplications. Bless Pastor Becky. Let the words you laid on her heart touch each of us and bring us closer to you. Bless Pastor Leo as he continues to lead and teach us. Bless the delegation to the Church Conference of the Global Methodist Church. Empower them to work for your glory. Bless our choir today as they pre present their gifts to lead us in praise. Bring special blessings on Women's Central as they begin their spring study and the Men's Fellowship on their upcoming retreat. We pray for all the groups who use our building. May your presence be felt in their meetings. We pray for healing for those who are ill and in pain. Be with those who are traveling. Bring them back safely to us. Bless our children and youth as the school year is wrapping up. Keep them safe. Protect them from the harm of the world. Be with us now as we continue our worship and praise. We ask all of these things in the name of our risen Savior. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Let's stand now and sing our opening hymn, hymn 302, Christ the Lord is risen today, and we'll sing all four verses.
My name is Kylie, and I'll be reading today's scripture from John 20 to 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the stripes of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the stripes of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw the two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him then what he had said to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly gracious Father, I just ask for your spirit to continuously live through and fill Rebecca by your amazing strength. As you continue to guide her on the path that you have placed on her for a long time ago, Lord, you know the plans that you have for her. But Lord, she leans into you and on you for your strength and your wisdom to help give her that wisdom and the strength to go forth and proclaim your true words. Those words that you have placed on her heart this day, that they will be received by the hearts and the minds of those of your children this day. And may they continue to grow deep within your children, that they will go forth and spread your good news to those around them, so that they will know you are king and you have risen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so how, how many of you are here today for Easter? Okay. How many are here for Resurrection Sunday? Okay. The rest of you had nothing better to do, right? <laughs> How many of you are here because somebody woke you up and said, get up, get dressed, because you're going to church? <laughs> okay, there's a couple hands for being honest. I appreciate that. Well, I read this interesting article by a pastor who, uh, his church was kind of divided. Well, do we call it Easter Sunday or do we call it Resurrection Sunday? And he says, well, we're going to call it Easter, and these are the reasons why. First, we're going to, uh, resurrection can sound like a really churchy word. It's not one that usually comes up at the grocery store line. Um, so it can kind of be insider language. But people, when you think Easter, you think of, you know, spring, and people can relate to that. So we call it Easter. Now, some don't like the word Easter because of its roots to an ancient pagan festival which the word did come from a festival. However, when we look at a broader scope, we also use the word Friday a lot. And that word is based on a Norse goddess named Frigg, F-R-I-G-G. -G. And then there is some recent research 
that says the name of Easter comes from a German word, and my pardon if you are German and I'm butchering this, Aufestium, which means resurrection. So regardless of what your reason is for coming, regardless of what you call it, can we all agree that we are here to celebrate life together? Yes. Amen? Yes. All right. So if you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, I invite you to join me in the Gospel of John. Now, the story of the, the life of Jesus, his ministry, the uh, death and resurrection are, all fa are found in all four of the Gospels. And there's four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all start out with this particular week by Palm Sunday, which we talked about last week, when tensions rose, when he ministered in different ways to the people, when there was this movement that was against him and ended up he was betrayed and then he was arrested and then he was, uh, accusations kept flying in the air and then they took him to the religious leaders and they sent him over to the government leaders and they took back to other leaders and all the while he's being whipped and stripped and beaten within an inch of his life until finally those cry, cries of the crowd that said crucify him were silenced by giving the crowd what they wanted. And Jesus Christ was put to death on a cross. Gospels tell us of his final words and when the light left his physical body, where his body was taken down from the cross and wrapped in a cloth and laid in a tomb, and that tomb was sealed shut. That was Friday. Saturday comes, it's Sabbath, there's no work, you don't do anything, no one could go pay their last respects even. It was silent. You could almost say deadly silent. And then we pick up on the third day, on Sunday. And while the story is a little different perspectives in the four uh, Gospels, three things remain the same. That the Resurrection Sunday was early Sunday morning, that the tomb was empty, and that Mary Magdalene was on site. Pick me up in John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Now, it's interesting that John wrote his gospel a full generation after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he did so for a specific purpose. For John, he had seen the fall of Jerusalem. He had seen, out of fear of persecution, the believers were scattering. And he saw believers start to kind of falter in their faith. And did they really believe what they said they believed? The early church needed to be regrounded. It needed some hope. And at times we do too. So verse 1 tells us that early that Sunday morning the garden tomb had visitors. Mary tells us, or excuse me, Paul tells us that, Paul, John tells us, I'll get the right person in a minute. John tells us that Mary Magdalene came to prepare the body. Now, if you're reading in the book of John, you'll realize that a few um, chapters earlier, we hear about Lazarus, who was in a tomb for four days. And according to scripture, and I quote, he stinketh. You can look it up, especially the King James. Okay? Okay. So those spices that they talk about that would have come would have been spices like aloe and myrrh because they would have primarily covered the smell of the decomposing body. And it was also seen as a way to honor the dearly departed. So by going early on Sunday, it was the earliest that anyone could go because they had just finished observing the Sabbath. So this woman was making her way through the garden early, it was dark, Really, the world was kind of still asleep. And to the tomb where she had seen Jesus laid a few days earlier. And yet she is surprised when she comes and it's wide open. So she does the next logical thing. She calls the disciples to come and see. So two disciples come. 
Look in, and there's no body in there. Literally, there's no body in there. No body <laughs> in the tomb. Okay, y'all need your second cup of coffee again. <laughs> All right, just making sure you picked up on that. And they said, yep, it's basically empty. And it's interesting what John says beginning in verse 8. He says, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first went, first went in and he saw and he believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. I see, not only foretelling the death of and resurrection of the Messiah was found in the pages of the Old Testament, like Psalm 22, or in reference to those three days that Jonah had in the belly of the whale, or even to Isaiah 53, which was written 700 years before. But there was also the Gospel's record of Jesus himself telling the disciples that the Son of Man would be rejected, suffer, die, and in three days rise. Even in John chapter 2, Jesus is talking about destroying and raising up the temple in three days. And the religious leaders are arguing. They're like, no, man, it, it took us like a really long time to get that temple up. Three days isn't going to cut it. And he, they don't realize he's talking about his body as the temple. Maybe hearing that their Lord was going to conquer death in a way like no one had ever seen was just too good to be true. Too hard to believe. Either way, both disciples, they came, they saw the empty tomb, and they left. But Mary Magdalene stayed. Take me up to verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped, and she looked in. Now, the other Gospels will tell you that Mary uh, Magdalene was alone, and some will tell you there were others with her, like the other Mary. And... That would make sense because girlfriends usually travel in groups. At least they do today, so it would have made sense that they did then. But it's Mary Magdalene who's mentioned by name throughout John's account and the other Gospels. Because Mary Magdalene being mentioned by name is for a specific reason. See, we don't know a great deal about her, but what we do know is that she was a woman who had been possessed by what they said, seven demons. You have to understand that word seven may or may not have been literally, but seven denotes complete. So if they say she was uh, being possessed by seven demons, it means that she was a complete mess. Emotionally, psychologically, she, her whole life was one big complete mess. It wasn't just a corner of it. And she was seen as a woman of means because she was able to support herself, but that doesn't mean she was really living. She was just kind of existing. Have you ever seen somebody or know, ever been in that place where you're not really living, you're just sort of there and existing? There's not a hope. There's not a joy in your life. That's how Mary Magdalene must have felt until she ran into Jesus. And he changed all that. He took her black and white life into a full color life, just vivid color. She felt loved and accepted and wanted. She was a sinner with a capital S, and she had been given grace. She'd been given a new life. So she must have been so shocked to know that Jesus not only was arrested, but that he had been sentenced to die on a cross, and then to see him, to stand at the foot of that cross and see him nailed to the cross, to watch him die and then be put in this tomb. So she arrives at the tomb and after everybody, after the disciples had left and she looks in and she sees these two angels and they ask her a question, why are you crying? Now if I'd been married, I would have said, uh, do you not know what's been going on? You know, I'm crying. She goes, I don't know where he is. So the very next thing that's asked over is, why are you crying? Everybody wants to know why Mary's crying. Why do you think Mary's crying? And so she responds by, you know, she's got to be thinking, seriously, you're asking me this question? So she says, she said, 
if you took him, tell me where you put him and I'll go get him. Now, a lot of times I've heard this read, if you took him, tell me where you put him. I wouldn't have been that calm. I think I would have had a little more emphasis behind, look, if you took him, I want to know where he is. I think she was a little more adamant than the little politeness we put in there. But then the person who asked her that was Jesus. And she just didn't realize it. And he goes, Mary. It's kind of when your parents use your whole name, <laughs> including the middle name, the last name. And you know they're looking to you. All he had to say was Mary. And she knew he was calling her. And she was surprised and she was startled. And she was overwhelmed and she was rejoicing all at the same time. And she turned because when Jesus calls your name, it causes you to turn. Whatever your attention was on, it goes to him. And he, you know, she just wants to give him a really big hug. He goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I, not yet. I've got to tell them I have to go to my father for, you know, for don't, don't hold me yet. I'm picking up in verse 18. So here are Mary Magdalene. She's seen him. She's spoken with him. Won't quite let her get that hug in, but that's okay. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord, and she gave them his message. She became that eyewitness. She saw him. She talked to him. She was in his presence. Her who had been a sinner, who her, who had been considered on the outside and who, to whom society had pushed to the side because she didn't meet that uh, certain criteria. Her, to whom he had set free because salvation is the greatest healing you will ever have in life. She gave the first sermon saying, I know he lives. I've seen him. I've talked to him. You know, now during all this, Jesus could have easily said, I told you so. I told you I was going to die. I told you I was going to rise in three days. I don't know why you didn't listen to me, but I told you so. But that's not what Jesus did. He could have reprimanded the disciples in saying, you know, hey, you didn't understand, and you've been with me for these three years. You should get what I'm, what I'm putting. You should pick up what I'm putting down. But he didn't. Jesus could have even had a sense of resentment that they didn't have, have faith. But he didn't, because that's not how Jesus rolled then. That's not how he rolls now. See, because even after Lazarus had died, a few chapters earlier, Jesus had arrived too late according to the family. But it's to them that he told the following he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This, this is a loaded passage. I am the resurrection. Scholar N.T. Wright says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project to not snatch people away from earth to heaven but to fill earth with the light of heaven. After all, that's what the Lord's Prayer is all about. The Lord's Prayer we said in the beginning, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That phrase points us to a resurrection power that wasn't just then, but is today. And Jesus didn't just stop there. He says, I am life. You know, in the Greek language, there are actually three words that we translate in English as life. But in English or in uh, Greek, there are three different words. Bios is one, and that's sort of like where you get biology from. That's your physical body. The other word is pronounced shuka, which is psychological life that, of the soul and heart and mind. And then there's zoa. Zoa is a divine life uniquely possessed by God. It's beyond us. It's what God pours into us. And when he said, I am the life, it's not just talking about, I am the life, but I have a physical body. It's not just uh, sukha, which I, I am life in that I have a mind that thinks. 
It is, I am Zoa. I am beyond this physical part and even more so from the holy God. But here's the thing. The other thing, I am the resurrection, I am life. Do you believe? Church, do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord? Do you believe he died and he rose on that cross, rose again for you, that he accomplished the impossible, going to hell and back for you, to buy our pardon, to pay the ransom for us to be set free? Do you believe that? Because here's the thing. Each one of us believes something. Because not making a decision about what we believe is a decision in and of itself. And I know I've said this before. We talk about if there's a fence, well, I'm kind of sitting on the fence about all of Jesus. Jesus doesn't live on the fence. You're either in with Jesus or you're not. You can't sit on the fence and watch heaven because you'll probably fall backwards into hell. That's just an illusion but, or an illustration. Do you believe? You know, we come here this morning for many different reasons. But do we believe? We worship at the feet of one that has the power over death. And it's not just death of these bodies. Do you realize the raw power that he showed by rising from the dead? He can bring anyone out of the grave with one word. One scholar said that had Jesus not specified Lazarus, in other words, said Lazarus come out, if he would not specified them, every tomb in Jerusalem would have given up their dead. Now that would have been a sight to see. People flipped when just Lazarus walked out. But here's the thing we face in life. Every single one of us has a 100% chance that someday we're going to die. Someday this body isn't going to hold our spirit and ourselves anymore. And those of us who have gotten a long the years that we realize that I can't do what I used to do. These bodies weren't made to last forever. And it's okay because salvation in Christ does. And you won't need this body one day. But here's the thing. What are you going to do with the life you've been given today? Today you have. What are you going to do with the life God has given you? When we believe in Jesus Christ, we're not only redeemed, but we are reconciled to God. And this brings us back to God's original intention for us. It is so beautiful that God makes each one of us different, with different talents and different gifts. Some are extroverts, some are introverts, some are really good artistic, some are really good at sports, some are really good at greeting people. Everybody with different talents and gifts for a reason, that makes up his body. It's not just about going to heaven one day. It's about living in community together now in abundance. Hopefully, joyfully, no matter the circumstances we face, we don't face them alone. If you feel like you're alone, Jesus is right there. He's not going to make you reach out to him, but he called you by name. You know, Mariners, we talk about being a praying church. Not because we believe in the words we say. We believe in the words he said. We believe in who he is. Amen. That is why we pray. We trust in him, not our abilities. Because everything that's done, every miracle that's taking place here, every healing that's having taken place, every salvation, like I said, that's the greatest miracle there is. That a holy God would reach down to sinners like us and say, I love you this much. I will send my son to make a way for you to come to me. Because you can't do it on your own. And I will be with you in the deep waters. And I will be with you in the storm. And I will be with you in the good times. And I will be with you in the bad times. I'm not leaving you. I will never leave or forsake you. That's my God. That's the one that calls out to you. That's the one that defeated death. See, the resurrection power we believe in all the life and all situations we face, no matter how challenging, how hopeless, how painful it might be, resurrection power brings the dead parts of our lives to life. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever cleaned your house and you go in the corners and sometimes you find things that you forgot about, sometimes they've died. 
or they've been dead for a while. And they don't necessarily have to sink, and you know they don't need to be there. But sometimes they do, and they kind of build up. Jesus helps get that stuff out of your life. Because eventually it does have a way of seeping back out into the room. And it'll seep back out into your relationship with him and your relationship with others. And Jesus says, let me clean all the corners of your life out. He rolls away all the stones. He makes the impossible possible. What is it you are facing today that seems impossible and improbable that you just can't even wrap your mind around? Do you realize that his power is there for you as he walks with you, as he is within you, as he has worked within you? And if he can do this, I can't, the imagination can't even embrace everything that Christ does to bring glory to his Father. Sometimes we just need some of that resurrection power today, and too often we only delegate it for one day a year. And it's here by the power of his Spirit. Maybe you've got a physical diagnosis and you feel hopeless. Maybe you need peace because your life's just rolling over and over in turmoil. Maybe you have worry or stress over a loved one. Or maybe you've even come up with the thought, Lord, why am I still here? What good am I, Lord? I can't do what I used to do. I'm not even sure where I am. Here's the thing. Easter is often a time where we get to come back and claim that resurrection power again, and claim the life he's always meant for us to have. And sometimes it's sitting there unopened, and we just don't pick it up for whatever reason. Easter is often a time when we also have baptisms, because our baptism is an outward sign of an inward beginning, where we have turned our hearts over to the Lord, and he's not only our Lord, but he is the lead of our life. Here's the one who we are obedient to, who, who we follow, who we give all our devotion to. Now, as a, as a kid, I was, ba I was baptized, you know, babe in arms, I was baptized. But as I got older and I got to that different place in my life, I reaffirmed that baptism and said, I'm owning this now. That's what a reaffirmation of baptism, we don't rebaptize, we affirm what God has done and is doing anew in our lives. And in three weeks, on April 21st, our young people, our confirmation class, they will be reaffirming their baptism. They've all been baptized, some in the ocean, some as babies, some, you know, as older. And they're going to reaffirm and claim it. God is doing a new thing in my life. And they want to extend that invitation to you. So on the 21st, if you feel like, I don't remember it then, but God is doing a new thing in me. I know he is. And I'm in a new place with him then we invite you to, to join us in that reaffirmation. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you say, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I, I want to start on a fresh foot on my relationship with him. I, I want to get my focus straight. Then you're welcome to come and be baptized as well. We do take that seriously. So we ask at the end of the service, if that is something you would like us to do, then uh, to check with the prayer folks who are either at the rail or at the prayer room and give them your contact information, and we will be in contact with you because we want you to know what, what this involves, what, what's involved with all this. Because when you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are baptized, man, the Holy Spirit just moves on in, and there's no way to explain it. But it's amazing, and God is moving in this place. And we've had folks already this morning says, I want that. I've been going to church all these years, but I want that. Not, that. not that they wanted to dance like Pastor Leo in the first service. You have to miss that part. You have to watch that online for later. But they said, I want that energy. I want that passion. I, wa I want to feel that way about Jesus. And when you do, don't be surprised when everything changes and life takes on a whole new meaning. He said, he's he said he would die and that he would rise, and he did, with power and presence beyond words, because that's who our God is. Our God is not dead. He is alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Will you pray with me? 
Holy and gracious God, we come before you this morning, and you know we're all in different places this Easter Resurrection Day. Some of us call it Easter, some call it Resurrection. So Lord, some of us had come just because somebody said, I'll treat you to lunch afterwards, and that's okay. Sometimes we just come as we are, and Lord, you receive us that way, but you don't leave us that way. You love us all, and you want to pour into us your spirit, every single person here, because you have created each person here unique. They are your beloved. Whether they feel like they are loved, Lord, you love them. And we're just asking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit pour down upon them, that they know your peace and your love this day that only a living God can give. Only a living God can give us true life. But we've got to let go of the dead stuff in our lives. And Lord, sometimes we're aware of the dead stuff in the corners and sometimes we're not. Show us that dead stuff we got to get rid of. Help take it out of our hands. Help clean us from the inside out. And trust you with our whole selves. Father God, we praise you this morning. Lord, as we come as your church, as, as, as sometimes our, our habit is that we, we say out loud to you and to everybody here why we praise you. And so, Lord, as, as we do that in this moment, we're going to invite anybody out to, to if they want to stand, I invite you to stand. If you want to say out loud why you praise God, why is God worth praising? This is our time. So let us lift our voices in praise to our God. Almighty God, we lift our voice to you and we pray to you. Lord, we praise you because you are ever faithful. We praise you for you are ever good. Lord God, we praise you because you love us while we are yet sinners and that proves your love. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to John. Let's stand and respond in our final Let's stand.
I'm going to invite you to have a seat for a moment. Uh, just a reminder that uh, as we, when we conclude here, that if you're online, you're welcome to uh, contact our prayer folks and let them know that you have an interest in either baptism, reaffirmation, or accepting Jesus Christ for your first time. Also, if there's any prayer concerns, because there are, for those of you who are on site, there are cards in the pew bags for your prayer concerns uh, that you can drop in any of the baskets before you leave. But we take this time, uh, remind you of the things going on. Please check the online calendar. Please check the bulletin, the back of it, with all the different things that are going on in this month. There's so many, I don't want to miss one. Uh, so please check that out. But we go into a time of joys and concerns, and since that does involve confidential things at times, we do not broadcast that part. So to those of you who have joined us online, God bless, and may you have a happy Resurrection Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. And those for you on site, again, we uh, have two microphones because I want to be able to hear.